Good morning. I welcome everyone to this, the sixth meeting of the committee at consideration stage. I remind everyone to switch off all mobile phones and electronic devices. The first item on the agenda is to decide whether to take item five in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. As Group 1's oral evidence session was not completed on the 23rd of April, the witnesses for that group and the promoter have been invited back to conclude proceedings. The evidence from this session will obviously be considered by the committee in its consideration of objections later at this meeting. I welcome witnesses back from Group 1 and from the promoter. We will recommence proceedings at the point where the session ended on the 23rd of April. It is anticipated that this part of proceedings will conclude around 10 a.m. As witnesses will now be familiar with the process for these evidence sessions, I will not take up valuable time restating the format which we will follow. However, following on from the last meeting, it may be of assistance if I clarify that the committee has not yet reached the stage in proceedings for formal consideration of amendments to the Bill. Once consideration of objections has been completed, there will be an opportunity for any party to comment on any draft amendments which are considered to be admissible before formal proceedings on amendments begin. From Group 1 objectors, I welcome back Stephen Hawkins, Diana Cairns and Alison Conley. From the promoter, I welcome back from the City of Edinburgh Council, Billy McIntyre, Charles Livingston, Associates of Brodies and Ian Alexander, Design Director of GM Architects. I now invite objectors to continue questioning the promoter on issues covered in Category 5. Do Group 1 witnesses have questions for the promoter? Thank you for inviting us back to uh, continue this evidence session. I would like to make a few final comments on Category 5. You have, interest, uh, you have indicated that you're only interested in matters subsequent to the Court of Session ruling, and because of this and the time constraints, we've curtailed the evidence that we had intended to cover and the questions that we had for the promoter. In the aftermath of the Court of Session ruling, City of Edinburgh Council feigned shock and disappointment and in the words of the Director of Children and Families, the ruling was entirely unexpected. We have proved that this is not true. City of Edinburgh Council have portrayed themselves as the innocent victims of an unforeseen judgment and have produced further propaganda to persuade the public that the only prospect of delivering a new school is by supporting this private bill. <laughs> Even in the letter written last week on behalf of the Council by Brodie's to PPAG, the truth is withheld. The letter states that the earlier opinion was superseded and so was not relevant to the decision subsequently taken by Council. But the hidden opinion of August 2008 was not withdrawn. The two opinions from 2008 are based on different questions and presumably they reflect the instructions given to the QCs. The August opinion had not turned out to be incorrect. Far from it, as it aligns closely with the view accepted by the Court of Session and the judgment delivered by the Inner House. The Council have consistently refused to provide information about their decisions to appropriate Portobello Park, and at no time did they even acknowledge the existence of the August 2008 opinion. In fact, its release in April 2014 may have been an accident, as it was released among other information which was marked as redacted, but for which the redaction had not been properly applied. It remains a real concern that City of Edinburgh Council continue to refuse to disclose accurate information and that the information they do provide is strewn with inaccuracies and errors. We do not wish to dwell on the past, but there are many instances of misleading information and the promoter's case is riddled with discrepancies. One example is the information about free pitch bookings provided during the consultation and how this contradicts information in the Children and Families Department report in December 2013 on community access to schools. We will come to this in Category 1, but staying in the meantime with Category 5, we would like to raise some red flags about the evidence provided by Billy McIntyre at the previous oral sessions. The first one regarding the consultation is at column 212 of the official report, where Mr McIntyre said, As I said in the Council report of March 2013, the raw data has been independently assessed. It was independently validated by PricewaterhouseCoopers. However, in their executive summary, PricewaterhouseCoopers state that because the above procedures do not constitute either an audit or a review made in accordance with international standards on auditing or international standards on review engagements, 
We do not express any assurance on the Portobello consultation responses summary. Another inaccuracy, this time about the assessment of alternative options, is when Mr McIntyre answered a question from Mr Flockert about using Holyrood High School as a decant accommodation for rebuilding on site. He told Mr Flockert on the 23rd of April at column 286 of the official report that using Holyrood High for decant was not an option because its rebuild predated his joining the council in 2008 and that it was not considered as decant accommodation because funding was not identified for Portobello High until early 2009. In fact, the old Holyrood High School was not vacated until summer 2009 and it was demolished the following year, so it had not been demolished by the time funding was identified for Portobello High School. We dispute the Council's claims about the perceived disadvantages of the alternative options. According to City of Edinburgh Council, a major drawback of rebuilding on site is the delay and expense involved because of the need to relocate St John's first. Yet, despite asking many times why the option of rebuild without relocating St John's was discarded in 2006, Mr McIntyre has been either unable or unwilling to provide any answers. It is our view that the Council are also deliberately misrepresenting the position regarding the tender from Balfour Beatty. The Scottish Government procurement guidance states that, in open and restricted procedures, all negotiations with candidates or tenderers on fundamental aspects of contracts, variations in which are likely to distort competition, and in particular on prices, shall be ruled out. Yet, as we have heard from Council officials, the Balfour Beatty tender has indeed been renegotiated on price and thereby falls open to challenge. Is this another example where City of Edinburgh Council simply considers itself to be exempt from the rules? Or should we assume that the Council will re-tender but does not wish to make that public, given the further delay that this will create to building a new school? The Brodie's letter to PPAG of 30th of April repeats their desire for objectors to engage in discussions about mitigation. But this is a pointless and insincere invitation, as it is absolutely clear throughout the private bill that we do not agree that legislation should be passed to allow the appropriation of this inalienable common good land. And the only possible mitigation is the withdrawal of the bill. And that concludes our comments on Category 5. Thank you. Thank you. Does Mr McIntyre, if you can make your comment very brief, because it was final comments. So if you've got any comments to make on what was said there, if, if you're indicating, but very brief. Um, thank you, convener. I know it's, um, it's not normally appropriate to have final comments, but um, I would like to uh, utterly reject any assertion that, um, that I in particular or any of my colleagues have, have misled either the committee or um, our uh, elected members or the public in any way. Just picking up some, some of the points, and I will, I will be brief. Um, Malcolm Thompson um, provided the original um, uh, council opinion in August 2008 and was one of the co-authors of the subsequent opinion in, um, uh, I think, I believe it was November 2008. Um, this is not based on different questions. This is based on a change of opinion. Um, I would remind uh, PPAG that um, whilst the judgment of the uh, inner house of the court session um, it was um, was not in favour of the council. The original judgment of the outer house of the court of session was, so um, the council was entirely justified to proceed on the basis of which it did, which was the joint uh, council opinion that was received and that was reported by the then um, council solicitor to council in the meeting of December 2013. I'll not dwell on the issue of, um, of validation by PwC. The report is in the public domain. Yes, it wasn't an audit that was undertaken in accordance with them um, uh, with international standards, but they are. A recognised firm of auditors, they were asked to do a degree of validation independently by the Council through myself. The scope of that review and the report is in the public domain. Um, Ms Connolly um, refers to, I believe, um, what things that I said in column 286, but I don't recognise what she said um, I said in column 286. Um, and I did say, and having been asked about Holyrood, that I would have thought um, that it would have been down to the absence of funding. Um, I made no reference, as far as I can see, to issues of decant or, or otherwise, but again, the official record, I suggest, shows exactly what um, I did and didn't say. Um, on the issue of procurement, um, the committee has already um, 
indicated that procurement is not a matter for this committee, but as I've said in previous um, meetings, um, the Council is well aware of its procurement obligations and will comply fully with those. Um, notice was given to um, the unsuccessful contractors through ODU um, after the Council took its most recent decision in um, 6th of February, and we'd have, we've had no expressions of any concern or objections from any of the previously unsuccessful contractors. Thank you. We now move back to the sequential order of categories and onto category one. I invite a spokesperson for group one to speak on the first set of issues in category one, which is loss of amenity, use of park, including associated issues of health and mental well-being. Um, I'm not going to make a, an opening statement. Mm -hmm. We stand by the evidence that we submitted prior to the committee meeting, just to also say that I think the health benefits and the the negative impact of the loss has been amply demonstrated by previous groups that have given evidence. But I have got a few questions, please. Well, we're not at questions yet, okay. so it's just the, well, I'll come back okay. to you for that. Um, so I invite a spokesperson for Group 1 to speak on the second set of issues, which is replacement of open spaces. Yes, is that yourself? That's me. So you don't have any statement to make on that? Well, just that, um, as we, we've said in our previous submissions, that... We remain highly sceptical that the replacement open space will ever be provided because the council's changed its position on it at least twice and it's not going to be part of the bill. So there's no obligation on the council to provide it. And because of what's gone on in the past, we don't actually have any faith that it will be provided. And that's a big concern to us. Um, and it's, I think it's, been, it's also been acknowledged by the council that it wouldn't adequately compensate for the loss of Portobello Park. It would be partial recompense, but it wouldn't um, be full re um, full recompense. And by the same token, we're sceptical about the Fields in Trust protection because this bill is seeking to overturn an alienable common good status, which is the strongest form of protection. If that succeeds, then. I'm sure it's much easier to overturn fields and trust status. And I believe information was submitted by Mrs Connolly previously to say that actually fields and trust have clearly stated in their information that if um, a council can make a good case for um, using a park for another purpose and they promise to improve facilities elsewhere, then they will be persuaded that that piece of land can be dispensed with. So we don't find that a strong or reassure, reassuring form of protection. Thank you. And I invite the promoter to speak and say the positions and all issues covered in Category 1. Thank you, Convener. I'll keep my introductory remarks for each category this morning as concise as possible, um, while still endeavouring uh, to provide the Council's response to these issues um, that the Group 1 objectors have raised. They have largely repeated concerns which have already been raised by other groups about the issues in this category. The committee has previously heard evidence from me, mainly on 26th of March, about the already uh, very high level of provision of accessible green space, which is and will remain in the local area. I don't propose to, to repeat that evidence today. However, I will address the other issues that have been raised by the, the Group 1 objectors both today and in their original objections and in their written evidence. Um, at the last session, uh, Mr Hawkins indicated one of the topics would be, uh, which would be of significant interest to the objectors in Group 1 was the Council's compliance with its open space strategy, which um, we assume means the, the land use policy OS1 of the local, um, Council's local development plan. That matter was considered in detail during the planning process, and the planning report of 4th December 2013 noted that because the proposal involves the local loss of open space, it by definition did not comply with the provisions of that policy. However, the policy does not preclude the development of open space in all circumstances. And the Development Management Subcommittee's view was that the clear benefits to the local community from the Placement School and the proposed compensatory open space outweighed the loss of open space at the park. The proposal was, was therefore considered a justifiable departure from the development plan. It's also worth reiterating that we cannot envisage any regular activity currently undertaken at the park that would not still be possible either on the replacement facilities on the park or in either the area of new compensatory open space the, um, or the many other areas of open space in the locality. There should therefore be no discernible loss of immunity for any particular recreational or leisure of activity. 
It's been suggested in the original objections of Ms Cairns and PPAG that the loss of park would result in a 25% reduction of Portobello's parkland. Uh, it would be helpful if the Group 1 witnesses could explain the basis for this figure and the definitions of Portobello and parkland that they have used in that calculation, as it is not a figure the Council recognises. The objectors may find it helpful to refer to the map we have produced before, showing the many other areas of accessible open space which are and will remain in the area. The net loss of open space to the area of 0.4 hectares, and whilst it is not um, a complete 100% um, replacement of space, the um, provision of the enhanced and significantly improved facilities um, will more than compensate for that. It represents just 7.5% of the area of Portobello Park in isolation, excluding the many other areas of open space in the area. The committee will be aware of the Council's position that the park is not well used, which is based on the usage audit carried out in 2009. The objectors in Group 1 have suggested that usage has fallen in recent years as a result of the failure by the Council to adequately maintain the park. I did explain at the last session with the witnesses from Group 3 and 6 how part of the park was for a period affected by archaeological works in connection with the proposal to build a new school, but that the usage audit predated um, those works by a considerable period of time. I will not repeat any of that evidence here, but would only observe that I assume the photographs which were provided by Group 1 objectors um, within the written evidence, although they are undated and unaccompanied by any descriptions, relate to the archaeological works, which well, uh, were, as the committee will have seen last year when you visited the park, fully remediated a considerable time ago. The Group 1 objectors have largely raised the same issues as earlier groups about the Council's proposals for replacement open space on part of the existing combined site, of Portobello High School and St John's RC Primary School. We have addressed this issue, and in particular the Fields and Trust issue, in our written submissions in respect to this group of objectors, as well as groups two and four and three and six, and in previous sessions before the committee. So I'll not repeat that evidence now. Um, I would, however, refer the committee to the minutes of the public meeting that took place in Medibank on 17th of January 2013 during the private bill consultation process. These minutes were included in the Group 6 Objectors materials for the, um, the meeting of 26th of March. Um, page 47 of those minutes record me asking um, whether Fields and Trust status would be supported by PPAC. The answer from the PPAC representative was, yes, this would be welcomed. It is not clear why PPAC now seem to have departed from that view. The objectors appear to suggest it was inappropriate to mention the Council's proposals for replacement open space in the consultation materials because it is not mentioned in the bill. And they also suggest that there is a conflict between the terms of the consultation documents and the Council's view that an amendment mentioning the replacement space would be an inadmissible, which we explained in our letter of 31st of January and reiterated in a written submission in respect of Group 1. There is no such conflict. It was entirely appropriate for the Council to include that replacement space in the consultation. The compensatory open space is an integral part of the Council's project. However, although the project cannot proceed without the bill, not every element of the project is relevant to or needs to appear in the bill. It is worth pointing out the bill also does not mention our proposals for the school layout, design facilities, etc., yet there would be rightly complaints if the consultation documents had not included any information on those matters, as they are similarly integral to the project. The Council's position therefore remains that an amendment to the bill relating to the replacement park would be practically and un workable and inadmissible. However, we are conscious that it is for members of the committee um, at the consideration stage um, to propose amendments and for the convener to decide on their admissibility. And we will, of course, um, be happy to, to comment on any amendments that are proposed. I believe the Council has been as clear as it possibly could about its commitment um, to providing the replacement open space. However, judging by the comments this morning um, and those made previously, the objectors seem determined to assume bad faith on behalf of the Council, despite reassurances on many occasions, including by the Council leader at the most recent um, Council meeting, that this matter was discussed on 6th of uh, February 2014. Given that, I feel there's probably nothing the Council could do or say that would um, reassure or satisfy them, unfortunately. As a final point, I would simply note that in relation to this and other categories being considered today, the Council would ordinarily have asked whether objectors had any suggestions as to how their concerns about our proposals might be mitigated. However, in the interest of time, it is uh, clear from previous comments that they have no suggestions to make other than that we should abandon the entire project. So um, we will refrain from asking that question um, in each category, but would of course be happy to hear any proposals that we wish to make.
Thank you. We now move to cross-examination of the issues in Category 1. I invite objectors Diana Cairns to question the promoter. Hey, um, I'd like to look at the Ironside Farrar report that was included with the Council report um, that went to the Council in March 2010. Um, and uh, everybody's got a copy of this because this document was submitted a while ago. Um, I'd like to look at page 5 and just ask Mr McIntyre if you would tell me what it says about the management of the park. Sorry, um, could you... Page 5 of the Ironside Farrar report that was attached to the Council report of March 2010. Perhaps um, you'd be good enough to read out what you think I should be well, reading out myself. OK. Rather than me speculating. Well, I'm supposed to be asking you questions, but I'm, I'll I'm, help you out by telling you it says it's got a very poor score for maintenance about management of the park. Similarly, under weaknesses, it says it's a poorly maintained park. The council's deliberately run down and neglected the park, hasn't it, to bolster its case for development? No, it hasn't. Well, I think there's a, there's a, a clear case of of neglect of the park. This report in 2010 said there were three benches. That was before PPAG got funding to put one in. There's now only one functioning bench. That's the one that PPAG put in. There's been a rundown of facilities. Um, what does it say about the construction of the pitches on page 16? the construction of the pictures? Yes. I assume, um, Ms Cairns, that you're referring to the penultimate sentence. This relatively limited yes. use is due to the low maintenance specification of the pictures, Correct. the lack of drainage and poor pitch yes. construction. Yes. So, poor maintenance specification and poor construction. In other words, if they've been properly maintained or properly constructed, they'd have been even better and yet they've been decried as being poor quality and not used. But maybe that's because of the poor maintenance um, of them. I'd like to go on to the, main, the park usage survey. Can you tell me when this was carried out? In the middle of 2009. Yes. Yeah. And can you tell me how many hours people were actually at work or school when it was made? I don't have that information to no. add. Well, I can tell you that actually there was only um, there were only a small number of children identified. There were only six hours within the sample when children would not have been at school. And of these, three of them were recorded as rainy. So it was, that was, again, one of the criticisms of that were found by this survey was that it wasn't used very often by children, but there were only three hours within ten, i.e. 30% of the time that children would have possibly been out playing on it. And we would say it was a small, a too small a sample to be representative. How many other parks were carried, were, had a similar survey carried out at that time um, to provide survey, a control? I, there was no necessity for a control. This was looking at the, the usage of this park. Well, with respect, I think when you're collecting data, you have to have some kind of control. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't and agree. And some comparison I and some agree. baseline... How can you say whether something's well used or not and I think unless you can compare it to something similar? I think the numbers speak for themselves, Ms Cairns. Well, I would beg to differ with you. Um, and on page 16, it says that the pictures were only used for a seven-week period. The season would begin on 15th of August and finish at the end of September. That's untrue, isn't it? Uh, that was um, incorrect, and that's been subsequently clarified. Yes, good. I'm glad. But that the you the bookings um, that uh, were made were um, referenced elsewhere within the report, as confirmed with the yes, relation. Yes, but, but that is an untrue statement. So, uh, it just so I wouldn't say it's untrue. It's an inaccurate. No, it's not true. Um, inaccurate. I'd like to move on to the photos. 
Um, we've obviously submitted many photos to the committee that shows the uses to which the park has been put, parties, fundraising events, races, football matches, etc. And as you know, following the archaeological dig, the park was left in a powerless state and unusable. And it took the council until 2014 after many emails and phone calls to rectify. That's correct, isn't it, Mr McIntyre? No, that's um, not correct, Ms Cairns. You will be loved. Um, I think you were um, there at the visit the committee had in yes. 2013 yes. when the park was fully remediated. Okay. You said 2014. Okay, sorry. I'm, I, that is my mistake. I meant 2013, but it was after numerous phone calls. Um, and those, those photographs actually don't just show the reseeding that took place after almost three years of neglect, but also the, the big tracks that were left after logs were felled and tractors were driven across the park. And that was part of the remediation work that was done. And do you know how that was paid for, Mr McIntyre? Can I just correct you? The, yes. um, it was not three years of neglect. It was a considerably shorter period than that. And um, the remediation works were paid for by the project. Well, it was 11, 12, 11, 12 13. That's three years in my book. It was, it was a long period of neglect. Things weren't rectified when they should have been. I have previously um, uh, reported to the committee the reasons why, the, um, at the last meeting, why yeah. the um, mitigation measures were not done um, immediately, <coughs> pending the outcome of the court session judgment. And the, the smaller photos show fly-tipping at the changing rooms at the east end of the park. This debris was left lying for seven months and took at least six phone calls before it was shifted. Why was that? I can't answer that question, Ms Keynes. Right. Well, is is it, it has it been subsequently um, after, corrected? After six phone calls, yeah, it was cleared. But I think that just contributes to the growing picture of deliberate neglect <coughs> by the council. It has not been um, deliberate neglect, and as I reported to the committee at the last meeting, the um, standard maintenance that's applied to Portobello Park um, was reinstated to its previous level um, at the, in early 2013, yeah. following the remediation of the, yeah. of the archaeological works. Do you know where the remediation was paid for? Why it was paid for? No, no sorry, from which fund it was paid? The project budget, the project to deliver a new Portobello High School. No, it was paid for from the Common Good Fund, £13,000 worth. No, it Yes, wasn't. it was. I'm afraid that's incorrect, Mr McIntyre. It was paid for from the Common Good Fund, and it was £13,000, and this is part of the project, as you quite rightly say, and yet the money was... You're trying to rob the Common Good Fund by developing this park, and you've also taken money out of the Common Good Fund to pay for remediation that is associated with the project to rebuild on Portobello Park. Convener, can I clarify that? Um, if, if you just give me two seconds. Sorry. Where, where are we trying to go with the money? Because obviously we don't have the facts in front no, of us. No, OK, well, I'm minute. sorry, I, I can if submit. You give me a, a, if you give me a second, what I'm trying to get to is, and yes. you used the word rob, so okay. I, I really don't think that was appropriate. But secondly, it might be your opinion, but I don't think okay. it's appropriate. Um, but you're saying the money came from the Common Good Fund. Correct. The council are saying, if you give me a minute, Mr McIntyre, the council are saying, no, it didn't. Yes. You're saying it did, and he said he didn't. Yes. So are we continuing this? No, no, or, I will or... provide written evidence to you after the meeting to that effect. You know, might, might I clarify that briefly? Well, unless it's... It, it, I don't it is want relevant that to that. I, no, it, you it, didn't. It is, it is my understanding, uh, because that was my instruction, that the remediation work should be paid for by the project budget. If for whatever reason, then, and it does need to be checked clearly, um, that those monies um, were taken from the Common Good Fund, that would have been incorrect and not in accordance with my instructions. Okay. And I will ensure that that's corrected. Well, if you can get that information, that would be good. Um, I'd like to have a look at the Development Management Subcommittee meeting report from um, December 2013, please. Um, can we look at page 11? It says the proposal would 
result in an increase in number of households in the locality which do not have access to the expected quantity and quality of publicly accessible open space, doesn't it? On page 11. I said on page 11 of the Development Management Subcommittee report of the 4th of December 2013, it says the proposal would result in an increase in the number of households in the locality which do not have access to the expected quantity and quality of publicly open space. It's, um, oh, it's the first one. The first, okay. yes. Is that correct? Is that what the report says? Yes. That's what the report says, okay. yes. So why did you say at the meeting on 26th of March at column 167, because Portobello Park does not count towards compliance with the standards that are set out in the Council's open space strategy at the moment, citing the school and Portobello Park would not alter the position of any dwelling in relation to the present standards? That's not correct, is it? Um, it is correct. Well, it says in the report from planning that it would result in an increase in the number of households in the locality which do not have access the expected quantity and quality of public accessible open space. So who's correct? Um, it's my assertion that uh, the information that I provided to the committee is correct and I provided the illustrative map showing the evidence to support that. So you're saying that planning is incorrect in what um, it says? I'm saying that there appears to be an inconsistency um, between what I said and what's in the planning report. Right, well, I would suggest that Planning are the people who work with these standards day in and day out, and I would have expected that. I will to be um, consult with um, the planning department and we'll clarify the okay. matter. Thank you. Um, lower down in that paragraph, it says there'll be the retention of approximately 0.6 of a hectare on site for enhanced amenity space, and that it doesn't compensate for the loss. So that report's saying that there will only be 0.6 hectare of parkland left on the park, doesn't it? It does? Yes. I'd just like to distribute this map. We have had this before, but just to the ease of... If somebody could take these from... 0.6 hectares on site for enhanced yes. amenity space. Yes. Yep. Yes. So I'd just like to have a look at this, this plan that's been previously submitted. I can pass copies up to the council as well. That's a map of Portobello Park. Okay, while, while we're handing those out, if yes. I suspend for, for two minutes, a member has to, to leave urgently for two minutes. Um, I, I'm recommence in a minute.
Sorry, Miss Cairns. Thank you. Everybody's got this map in front of them, and you can see the red hatched area, which is the area that will be left as open space or parkland following the development of the park. Um, so the park's roughly six hectares, take away 0.6 of a hectare, that leaves 5.4 hectares of that park being lost, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Well, it looks as though it's not parkland anymore to me. Um, you say that the new park at the current site will be 2.6 hectares. Subtract this from 5.4 and you get 3.24 hectares. So the loss of open space will be 5.4 hectares without the new park. If you believe that there will be a new park at the current school site, it will be a loss of 3.2 hectares. And yet you say the loss will only be 0.48 hectare. That's not correct, is it? Uh, it is correct, uh, Ms Cairns. I've previously referred to this um, in, in evidence to the committee. Um, the park, size of the park um, is 6.43 hectares. Um, of, um, of that, 1.57 hectares would be um, assigned for two all-weather pitches, replacing the park's existing grass pitches. Um, 1.62 hectares, which is a quarter of the parkland, would be um, uh, remain or um, have improved public walkways, woodland or new cycle paths. I note that your hatched area included, it says included wooded area, but there are significant other areas of wooded area that form part of the park. Um, and 0.6 hectares, which is the area referred to as an enhanced amenity space, correctly referred to as that in the planning report, um, would be converted to a landscape open space in the southeast of the park. Um, that leaves 2.64 hectares, of which the compensatory open space on part of the combined existing site um, of 2.16 hectares um, would be um, a significant compensation towards that, leaving um, a, a residual area of 0.48 hectares, which I referred to in my introductory statement. Right, well, that's a statement you've repeated umpteen times during these evidence sessions. The bottom line is, look at the map, that tells you what's going to be left. Plastic pictures aren't open space. We're talking about parkland that is freely accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's what's going to be left of it, 0.6 of a hectare. And, that, and if you believe there's going to be a new park, there's still going to be over three hectares loss in an area that, despite what you say, is not well served by open space. This was acknowledged in a previous um, local plan, the North East Edinburgh local plan identified a deficit of open space in the local area. There's going to be at least 3.24 hectares loss, if not 5.4 hectares loss. You can't I, dress it up as anything else. I'm That's not, the amount of parkland that will be left. I'm not dressing up as anything, Ms Cairns. That, um, uh, what I've said is a statement of fact, um, okay. and we've repeated that evidence to the committee on many previous occasions. I would refer you to the, the map showing the many areas of um, uh, open space, both large and small, that exist in, in the local area. Um, I think that speaks for itself. Well, it's Together with the extent to which the households in the area um, are, uh, have access to those spaces already. Yes, but as, you've, as, has, been, oh, as, as has been reported in the, the Council's planning report, it's going to leave a number of households worse off. And it also says that it will be further for some people to walk to. It's close to an existing park. This is the replacement park. So it may be deemed superfluous, and it's not as large as Portobello Park. That's correct, isn't it? What's not as large as Portobello Park? The, the, the proposed replacement space. No, it's not. No. And it's, and it's next to an existing park. OK, I think it's clear for all to see that that's the paltry amount of space that will be left on, the, on the, the park. Let's not beat about the bush. There's going to be at least three if not five plus hectares loss if this park is developed. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, Mr. well, I think I'm going to hand over to Mrs Connolly. I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions about the, the use of the park. Um, can Mr McIntyre tell us, is there a system in place for booking pitches and how will eligibility to free access be determined? Is, sorry, I'll repeat it. We're talking, that I'm, I've jumped ahead to uh, the, the artificial pitches that the Council proposed to provide on Portobello Park. And I would like to ask, 
Is there a system in place for booking pitches and how will the eligibility to free access be determined? At present, there's no system um, been identified because that uh, the necessity for that system is some um, years hence, um, assuming this bill would, would proceed. And eligibility is um, determined by those within the local area as um, uh, previously reported to committee. The Council have been preparing over quite a few years a policy and a strategy for community access to school facilities. You'll be aware of that. And you're suggesting that there will be special arrangements for Portobello High School that will be justified and accommodated within that policy. But in a report that Julian T made to the Education, Children and Families Committee on the 10th of December 2013, she says... It is proposed that a revised scheme of charges would be applied systematically across the city and also that an online booking and payment system for lets of school facilities will be tested from April to June 2014. A full rollout is scheduled for September 2014. There's no mention of exceptions or special arrangements and it's clear from this document that the proposals for Portobello High School, as described in your consultation, are unworkable. Can you shed any light on that? Um, I'm not sure how you're coming to the conclusion that these proposals are, are unworkable. Um, the fact that the previous report from uh, Gillian T does not make reference to um, the exception um, is, does not in any way suggest that there will not be an exception. That exception has been previously approved by Council, well, I which is the, if I could finish, um, Ms Connolly, which is the overriding authority in terms of decision making for the Council. The arrangements will be put in place at the appropriate time to make sure that this, um, that this is workable. Um, there is an exception that's been applied in Portobello in terms of the use of these pitches and access to these pitches because of the very unique situation um, that that school would find itself in if the bill goes ahead and if the school can be built there. To suggest that um, we would not um, either implement that um, or manage that effectively is, is totally wrong. It seems very strange that on such an important issue there's no mention of it in a document that clearly states a revised scheme of charges would be applied systematically across the city. And it's coming from the same department. It's from the Children and Families Department. So I would recommend we don't have time for me to labour the point just now, but it might be interesting for the committee to refer to this review of community access to schools and perhaps I could leave copies with you. Thank you. And it, uh, Could I respond to that final point? If you want to finish, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. apologies. Sorry. Um, it sets out the Council's strategy for community access to schools, as the title says. Thank you Just to respond to, uh, to that, uh, there would be occasions where Portobello High School <coughs> would charge for the use of these facilities, which is why it's entirely appropriate um, for that uh, document to refer to charges across the city. Um, access to the pitches would not be, in all circumstances, free. Um, and in some circumstances would be, um, uh, would be chargeable. And there are other circumstances in, other, um, uh, in all schools across the city where um, lower rates are charged in certain circumstances or for certain groups. Um, so what um, Ms T said in her report is entirely consistent with what I'd remind you Council has approved will be the policy that will be applied to the use of these pitches in future. It sounds like we're moving into a very grey area with no, a lot of different circumstances. But can I just ask, is there anything to stop a future council withdrawing any special arrangements that have been suggested for Portobello High School? Sorry, Ms Connolly, could you repeat the question? Yes, is there anything to stop a future council withdrawing any special arrangements that you have suggested for Portobello High School? Uh, why, why would a future council withdraw? And it's not I'm not asking why, I'm just a asking a if, council if has, we could. The council has decided that that is the, um, the practice that will apply at Portobello Park. And the Council the decided in 2010 that they didn't need a replacement park, and the Council then decided later that they would support a, a replacement local park. So what I'm asking, is there anything to stop the Council changing their mind? I, I can't speak for what um, future um, Councils would, would do. What so they could possibly change do. their mind? Um, the Council has given a commitment across two administrations now, two separate and different administrations, um, to, uh, to build the new school in Portobello Park, provide these open space compensatory measures. But if they felt... I see, I see no reason why that any future council would renege on that. Unless they felt in future that the circumstances made it appropriate for them to do so. And I wouldn't um, uh, certainly advocate that there would be any circumstances that would suggest that that would be appropriate. Can I just check, is there anything that 
as it stands in this private bill that does does commit City of Edinburgh Council to provide free access to the pitches? No. OK, thank you. I'd like to just move very briefly on now to um, the Secured by Design guidelines. Secured by Design is a police initiative owned by the Association of Police Officers and Secured by Design Schools is one of several guidance documents that aims to reduce crime in our built environment. In the most recent planning application, City of Edinburgh Council referred to a Secured by Design statement. We're unable to find a copy of it on the Council's planning portal but the reference to it suggests that the Council are adhering to these guidelines. The guidance states that multi-use games areas and artificial playing surfaces, usually with lighting for nighttime use, are expensive facilities that are often targets for intrusion, vandalism and misuse. They need to be carefully planned, managed and protected using all appropriate secured by design guidelines and specifications. The guidance also goes on to advise that illumination of facilities will inevitably draw local attention to them at night. Lighting needs to be coordinated with actual occupation and use of the particular facility, such as evening community use, to avoid wasting energy and unwanted attention at times when there are no users or capable guardians present. We believe that implementing these principles will affect the unsupervised access, especially for children. Do the Council have any comments to make about their plans for the informal access they refer to? Uh, the informal access is, um, as we previously say, uh, set out, um, and is entirely consistent with the, um, the Council administration's desire to improve access to all um, school facilities within the area. They are public, um, uh, public utilities and should be um, as open and accessible as possible. It is in, in accordance with the, uh, the wish to make the facilities available, but is it in accordance with the secured by design guidelines, which presumably have to integrate with that desire, and security has to be an aspect that's taken into account in the arrangements that are made? It's the secured by design is there's a document been produced which has um, been issued by Lothian and Borders Police, which covers a number of the items you're talking about. And, I think there's quite an emphasis in Secured by Design on, on passive surveillance, that spaces are open and clearly visible. Um, there's another emphasis as well on lighting as well, and, and we have adequate lighting within the site because we have a, the SUS Trans cycle route, we have the paths in there. We want the place to be adequately lit at night. Um, there's no awkward or unlit areas. I think the lighting is about 10 metre centres, which is standard on the building, 2 point metres high. Um, the lighting poles are about 6 metres high. Um, generally on the site. So we believe that it's adequately lit. We've had a, a report produced which um, endorses that and we've followed the spirit of the report. The, the guidance also suggests that the lighting can attract unwanted attention at times when the facilities are not booked and that there should be arrangements made to control that. Um, but moving on, you mentioned paths and the document refers to the importance of site boundary and states that a clearly defined boundary using a fence, wall or other effective barrier against intrusion is a prerequisite for a secure site and to define ownership. A secure boundary will help staff manage the school site by limiting trespass and by channeling visitors to the site through appropriate entrances. A secure boundary will also frustrate the intruder intent on breaking into the school out of hours and or limit the quantity or type of goods that can be stolen. Now, the document referred to above advises that public footpaths immediately outside boundary fencing can affect security, yet a key feature of the, the scheme that you're proposing is the provision of public footpaths around this site with the express intention of encouraging public access. Does this not contradict the principles of secured by design? And can we ask if the Council have consulted with the police regarding the potential security of their proposal? Yeah. Um, again, we consulted with Lothian Borders Police on, this, on, on this, the design of the scheme. We had an audit of the proposals by them, and we're satisfied that it meets the secured by design requirements. And there's been a report released, which is in public domain, um, regarding um, by the Community Safety Department regarding the security of the, bu the building. If we can get a hold of the little, little map, can maybe explain a little bit more about the nature of the, pr the proposals and the nature of the... We've all been at meetings where we've had this... Uh, description provided, are you? Sorry. Okay, go on. 
given that there's been a lot of information this morning that we've all had, um, I think you know, it, it's entirely correct that, that the Council get it. I would point out, however, um, as we go through this, it is 22 minutes past nine. I will give to 10 past ten because you, so you lost some time, but just making aware of the meeting will close at 10 past ten, so just to make you aware of that. But we'll, we'll go to the map. <coughs> Here's, here's the map here. I mean, the principle of, this, of the security of the school is really that the school has a 2.4 metre high fence right along the back, right round here and right round to this point here on Park Avenue. The front end is protected by a 1.2 metre high fence, which is low. This area here is lit by 6 metre high poles along the Sustrans cycle route and within the courtyards and on the building there's lights at 2.8 metres high, roughly at 10 metre centres. There is... Um, statements within security design guidance that you know you have to have no dark corners that type of thing that people can look and do untoward things so we believe that we have um managed that and we've designed it as such um the front door of the school's got a double door entry it will be open during the times of access and egress from the school at the beginning of the end of the day and at lunchtime but it'll be controlled during the day and there's somebody permanently situated at the front door which will control access to the school the school Kind of manner is to be open at the front with the with the public plaza. I think that's an important thing. It's an important aspect of the school. Being a community-based high school, the idea of it being open and looking open is, is important, but also to be secure is really important as well. So that's how that has been des designed. Yeah. Okay. Just if I can add to that, convener, um, it's something that the authority has sought to um, to do whatever possible, and it is a balance to strike between security and accessibility. Um, the new Borough Muir um, on the Fountain Bridge site um, is uh, similarly configured. It's adjacent to a new area of uh, open space, about 0.3 hectares of a, a small public park. But the frontage, the school will look out onto the canal, and the frontage has been designed uh, with very, very minimal um, fencing and, um, and, and barriers to make sure that there's a, a high level of permeability for both the public and the, and the school, because these are public buildings, they are um, uh, public amenities. And we need to make sure that they blend into their surroundings rather than surrounding them with 2.4 metre high fences. A 1.2 metre fence at the front of the building presumably will allow anybody who wishes to get in, or most people, at least access if they wish to do so, to the site. Yes, but I would suggest that given um, where the school is going to be located and its, um, its locality, it would be better to have that than a 2.4 metre fence along the front, unless um, those in the local area would prefer that. Perhaps not. I don't have any more questions on the secured by design. I think Stephen has a Yeah, and if we move on to the um, replacement open space, um, you've stated that the design of the replacement park has already started. Can you please tell us why those who are losing the current Portobello Park have not been involved in this? I've never stated that the design of the current park has started. Mr. You, you didn't? Okay. Uh, I, I so, do not believe that I have. Right. Okay, you're being consulted. You, the, what's the consultation that you're doing? The consultation hasn't actually um, begun in earnest yet. Uh, that would be rather premature because um, that open space will be only created if the project to deliver new Portobello Park, uh, so high school in Portobello Park, can, can proceed. But the local so the consultation that yeah. Okay, so Mr. McIntyre was speaking there. Okay. The, My um, apologies, it's just that, you know, as you say, time's yes, pressing, madam. When you're speaking, you don't speak over someone. I mean, that, that's a basic rule uh, of manners. So, Mr McIntyre. Thank you, convener. Um, the committee, uh, sorry, the council, as you'll um, no doubt uh, undoubtedly recollect, um, agreed to delegate this matter to the local neighbourhood partnership, and the, neighbor, the local neighbourhood partnership has committed to consult with um, all of those in the local um, area. Um, on the potential future use of, the, of that um, area of space, which will be informed by the considerable responses that were received during the, um, the consultation um, on the private bill itself regarding what potential uses there might be of that space in the future. Okay, in previous um, um, discussions and consultations, there's been a joint approach between the two neighbourhood partnership um, subsections, Crinkton, Dunningston and Portobello, Craig Miller. Why was that not considered this time? They're all part of the, um, the overall local area, and I'm sure there will be um, close working between the two. In so why have you designated to Craig and Tinney Dunningston? Because it's within that area that the um, As area opposed space to lies. a joint one. Yeah. Okay, I hear you. Well, 
I thought you heard me the first time when you acknowledged that mm -hmm. Mr McIntyre. That, that was um, the proposal, and I, I can't recollect that um, the suggestion of a joint approach ever having been suggested um, either by any local um, elected members in amendment or by um, you or any of your colleagues in terms of your deputation to that meeting. That's certainly something that could have been considered if it had been identified, but it wasn't identified until you've just suggested it. Why can't the council commit to providing an area of land with designated boundaries as part of this bill? Um, that was uh, explained in our letter of 31st of January, the council's reasoning in relation to that, that it would be both um, difficult to uh, define um, because the exact uh, footprint of the replacement or expanded St John's RC primary school um, has not yet been identified and uh, in any event um, we don't believe that it would be admissible in relation to the bill. Um, if objectors feel otherwise then they're free to um, propose to members uh, an amendment that, that you would like um, at phase two of this stage and then it would be for the convener to decide on admissibility. Okay. Um, Mr McIntyre, you say that um, I mean, you put much store by the fact that the council leader has committed to providing this open space. Um, how did the council leader approach this situation in 2010? Uh, Mr Hawkins, you'd have to ask the council leader that. OK. Well, I can tell you from public record, the council leader voted not to support converting this area into open space. It's not for Mr McIntyre to speak on behalf of the council leader. It isn't, no. Okay. Then, it's not. The no. council leader has changed his opinion, as you've now told okay, us. Then. So uh, different administrations have come in in that time. So I'm not quite sure the point that's... Well, the council leader was part of the council at that time. But different administrations. Okay. You've said that two administrations have now supported this. Um, I thought that the previous administration had ruled out providing this open space and as recent as 2012, just before the um, previous administration fell, it refused to accept the mitigation of providing open space on the existing site. Is that not correct? I, um, I may have confused my timing and if I have, um, I, I will apologise. Right. Are you confused about whether it's been two administrations or one administration? I, I would um, need to clarify that, which I will. Okay. I can spend time doing it just now, Mr Hawkins, or, or no, I can do, I it, mean, do it with No, I mean, a simple yes or no. Um, sorry for sorry. speaking over you. Can I come in with something? I mean, I mean, Mr Hawkins, I think there's a risk we're going around in circles, but we come back to the point, and I won't go over the detailing unless the convener of the committee would wish me to, but we believe that the most appropriate protection here to hopefully uh, put at rest concerns that the council might do something else with this replacement open space if it is delivered should the project go ahead is the fuels and trust protection and as we have heard that's something that you personally and your colleagues have previously also supported if something was to happen which we do not believe would given the, the uh, commitments that have previously been given by the council which are still relevant still active then if uh, yourself or others wished at that time, you could go and speak to the Fuels and Trust about it. It is them that would have to agree to any changes. To clarify, Convener, I was incorrect when I said um, I've confused the timing of when the administration changed. But what I would um, remind Mr Hawkins that the approval um, to, to go ahead with the, um, the revised open space proposals um, was, um, was made unanimously by the Council. Thank you. Tell me, Mr McIntyre, how quickly can the Council reverse a decision? I think it's changed to, I think, it'd be six months. OK, thank you. Under the standing orders. Thank you. Public. And I think that, that is one of the difficulties, as you say. Commitments now made, and you've said it yourself, Mr McIntyre, that um, the Council has the overriding authority. So, you know, commitments and expressions of promises made here? I don't know. OK. Um, you brought up the fuels in trust. And yes, I think you would find that, well, I think you'd find very few people who would not say that fuels in trust is an extra layer of protection. 
but it isn't as good as the protection provided, um, say, by common good um, or by an, an act of parliament. Would you agree with that? Um. Ian, do you want to cover that? Um, Sorry, that I, I agree. It, uh, well, in the Council's position, it is the best protection that's available. The Council, as we have previously said, you, you talk about common good protection. The Council is not meant to do anything with the park, but if it wanted to sell it, the legislation allows the Council to sell it subject to the consent of the Court. The Court, when we talk about disposal of common good, inalienable common good assets, is very clear they will weigh up the benefits uh, to the community in connection with such a proposal. There was case law to do with that, and a court would be bound by those previous case law decisions. If Fields and Trust is not so bound, Fields and Trust would have to weigh up uh, any such proposals as they see, see fit. And that is why, in the circumstance, we believe the Fields and Trust protection is the best proposal here to allay any concerns that uh, objectors might have. Can I, can I remind Mr Hawkins that it was he who proposed the motion to um, our Council Committee? Um, to um, confer fields and trust status on an area of land which was already part of the common good. So you must have considered it had some considerable merit. I've stated that there is very few people who um, would not regard fields and trust as an extra layer of protection. You've raised the issue of um, the protection of the golf course. Um, the Council deliberately dropped the golf course out of its list of 20-odd parks to be dedicated fields in trust. But you presented a motion to council committee, which was approved, which yes. um, which conferred fields and trust status on an area of land which is already part of the common good. Now you suggested that common good protection um, is higher than fields and trust, but nevertheless you felt it sufficiently important to press the council to confer fields and trust status on that land. Well, we and see we're, 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 we're suggesting a similar level of protection to both the area and the existing park okay. and the new open space. Made. Thank you. Okay. Right, and I take it you've accepted my point that the council can change its opinion and its mind and what it does over charging, over protection of open space as it wishes, and that feels interested. Yes, an extra level of protection, but it is only Except that. Mr. McIntyre's point, I said it was made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Do you have any further yeah. questions? Yes, I've got questions about um, the replacement of open space. The council, the council has. Sorry, that was a question. Put on. The council has changed its mind twice now, um, and on the replacement of open space, it said it was going to replace it in 2006. Then it renewed in 2010. It said that the current site was in the wrong place and that it needed the capital receipt. Well, if it was in the wrong place in 2010, it's still in the wrong place, isn't it, Mr McIntyre? No, it's... Uh, I correct you that the Council has changed its mind once, not twice. Um, the decision to, um, to not pursue compensatory open space in 2010 was the first time that the Council took that decision. Um, the, um, there was no previous decision um, to the contrary. Um, however... <coughs> um, uh, it is uh, entirely in the right place, as was evidenced by this significant um, level of responses to that effect that came through from um, the local community as part of the, the uh, private bill consultation process. They were um, significant and many, and invariably um, positive about the prospect of, um, of that new era of open space in, in the area. Right. Do, do you accept that in the March 2010 report, it said that... The, that there would, it was possible to get a capital receipt of 3.9 million for the, that site. That's correct, isn't it? I have previously in the, in the March 2010 report, it's identified as having a capital receipt of 3.9 million, and you've said that you're going to commit a further 1 million to the park. So the total cost of this new park, replacing the existing park, including the lost capital receipt, is 4.9 million. I, I'm Can not. You Sorry, if I, do, you, do you want to... Okay. I'm sorry. Can you tell me if this has been factored into the cost of the new school on the park? The cost of the new school in the park? Yes. Um, no, because it's not technically a cost. It is a, a site that's already in council ownership <coughs> and um, would only be a cost if um, a, 
further expenditure was required by the council. So the cost, as you know, because I've furnished you with a, um, the detailed analysis of the um, elemental costs for the, um, the new um, school on the park, um, include a million pounds. Um, that excludes the demolition of the existing buildings, but it doesn't include any um, a lost capital receipt because that's not actually a cost. We're using an area of land that the council already owns for a different purpose. But if we're going a capital receipt of 3.9 million and you're committing a further 1 million... In the same uh, way as rebuilding or the current site doesn't include the intrinsic value of that site, neither option includes yeah. the intrinsic value. Well, so okay. it's not, it's, it is not a cost. Well, I beg to differ with you on that. It seems that back in 2010, the council said that foregoing a capital receipt for the site of £3.9 million was that it was not considered an efficient use of council assets, particularly given the unprecedented financial difficulties and pressures on capital budgets. Given that it was reported in the news that the council had written off £5.5 million of debt following the repair scandal, I find it amazing that you preparing to, to really forgo this this money that you could raise for the site. If you wish. But could, I, no. could I just remind committee that the, um, the, the differential cost of delivering the alternative, which is a phased rebuild on the current site, would be £13.4 million pounds more than uh, rebu uh, that building the new Portobello High School on Portobello Park. So in terms of um, the finances, um, the proposed option is by far and away the, um, the most effective use of public funds. Can I just say that you refer continually to this 13 million, which includes, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but a figure in the region of excess of 10 million pounds, which is an inflationary adjustment. So I think it's a little bit misleading, the 13 million that you just mm. quoted. No, it's not misleading because um, I'm, in a charter, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so am I. So I'm familiar. Well, you'll be familiar with the way that um, cost projection should work, and cost projection should take into consideration um, the uh, the expected cost at the time of delivery. So construction inf inflation is increasing. Um, the provisions for future inflation within the um, the costings that I've shared with you um, are based on the the latest construction industry. Uh, projected indices. So it's entirely appropriate because if we were to build the alternative um, um, solution and I was to go to council and ask for funding to do so, that's the amount of money I would be asking them for. I think, again, there are a lot of factors that are built in as assumptions in that model that we would disagree with, but I don't think we have time just now to go into the detail of that. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the placement to open space. As recently as April 2012, the council d um, rejected an amendment by the Greens to create an op a place of open space on that that site, didn't it? I believe so. Yes, it did. So then, fast forward six months, what changed? Uh, the pressure, um, the change in circumstances around the, um, the outcome of the court session case and the, um, the obvious pressure from the local community to... Uh, put in place some form of alternative open space provision, which we've, which we've now done. So we're being criticised before for not providing it, and now we're being criticised now for providing it. It's, you know, it's, well, it's, we, we, it's, can't, we can't win. OK, well, all I can say is the council was very slow to respond to the concerns about loss of open space, because that was fully six years after the plans to build on the park were announced, so you were very slow to respond to that. Um, why introduce, suddenly introduce the promise of a new park just before the private bill consult, consultation? It was provided to provide an inducement to people to support the bill, wasn't it? Um, no, it was an appropriate response to the concerns that had been articulated, including by right. PPAG, about the necessity for further open space compensation. So we were responding to what the local community was telling us they needed okay. and they wanted. I think that's entirely appropriate. Can we have a look at the report to full council of 25th of October 2012? Paragraph, I'll let you get it open. 3.123, it says, once the existing Portobello High School is demolished, the remainder of the site would be converted to open space. Is that correct? Yep, yes. it is. Can we turn to Appendix 6.6.2? Please. 
Index. Six point six point two. Could you perhaps share me with the page number? That would be easier for me to. I don't know if there is a page number. The, the yeah. bottom. Bottom of the page. Yes, page 62. Yep. Yes. And it says, this leave 1.2 hectares, oh, leaving 2.25 for hectares available for sale, including the existing primary school buildings. Hectares for sale. And then in the next paragraph it says, this option would also enable a land sale this is at the current site, to be progressed pending the school move, including the potential for housing to commence. So, in one part of the report you're saying you're going to create a park on that space. Elsewhere in the report you're saying it's going to be sold for housing. Are you, are you surprised that people are sceptical about the replacement of open space on this site? Um, are you really? Yes, I am surprised. This was the outcome of a feasibility study that predated the decision of Council. It was in that report. Yes. It should have been amended. Sorry? Missed. It should... Should I have amended... In the same, in the same report yes. of 20, October 2012, mm -hmm. it says in one part of the report that the council is going to create a park mm -hmm. on the existing school site, and elsewhere in the report it says that the land is going to be sold. Yeah, but you, you said something the, at the what, end of which I missed. It should, should it, well, it should have been amended. Right. That's what Thank I'm you. saying, then. That it should have been amended. Okay, thank the you. Okay. The feasibility study predated the production of this report by some time, and I was reporting back the results of that feasibility study. Well, so should... perhaps um, with hindsight, um, that should have been made clear in the report. But the final decision yes. that the council took is unambiguous and clear, and has been since since it took it. I'd, I'd just like to go on to the bill and, and Gillian T's letter of the 31st of January. She says it doesn't authorise the, the construction of a school um, and it says the provision of a new park is outside the scope of the bill. Yet the private bill consultation says Portobello school private bill, not Portobello park private bill, but the bill's allegedly got nothing to do with the school. Um, the majority of the form was taken up with bullet points about a new park, isn't it? The consultation form has a lot of bullet points about the wonderful new park that's going to be built on the current site. Consultation, what, form, what document are you referring to? It's got information about a new area of open space. It had a whole question about a park, a replacement park. My, my point is, if the bill has got nothing to do with providing a new park, why did the new park feature so prominently in the Council's consultation literature? The question we asked was, do you support the Council's proposal to change the use of Portobello Park from a public park to being the location for a new Portobello High yes. School? But it's got a lot of information about the replacement park. It's got a whole question, and it featured prominently in in the consultation literature. That was misleading. If it's not part of the bill, it shouldn't have been in the consultation literature, I, should I it? I get back to what I said in my introductory statement. Um, it was relevant to the to the, the bill because it was an intrinsic part of the project, as was um, information about designs and alternative site options. That was. I'm sure you would have criticised us if we'd not made any reference to that. I, th I think it's disingenuous to pretend that the bill's got nothing to do with the cons construction of a school and then call it Portobello School Private Bill and to feature a park as an inducement to people to support it when the park is not going to be part of the bill. Bottom line is there's no obligation on the council to provide this new park and it will never be provided. Ms Gaines, um, if... Uh if you disagree with the Council's view on the admissibility of an amendment to include the replacement open space in the Bill, you're free to submit an amendment to one of the committee members to propose and the convener will take a view on its admissibility. It's not, it's not a decision for the Council, it's ultimately a decision for the convener. The Council's expressed its view, but if you disagree, you can 
take matters into your own hands. Thank you. Can I just take a point of clarification, however? You refer to Portobello School. Is that the council or, or the council's? Bill? This is the council's the consultation. Right, the consultation. Right. I just want to clarify because obviously this committee is not called Portobello School. I know, but well, precisely. But this is Portobello Park Private Bill. So why does the consultation okay. form for the bill say just Portobello point of School? That's that is my. It's, to me, that's an anomaly. Okay. Okay. Uh, is Portobello Park Private Bill? No, it, well, that says school. Anyway, that's that's all our evidence on this category. So that's questions, okay? Our questions. Do, do the promoter have any questions? No. Okay. Are there any final comments on category one? Yes, just quickly. Um, I, th I think the, the the councils claim the park's not well used in order to bolster its case for development and argue the park's surplus to requirements. If usage of the park has fallen, that's due to the council's removal of facilities, underinvestment, and its neglect of the park. And research shows that once a park becomes neglected, it's a self-defeating cycle. People stop going there. Um, the development of the school in Portobello Park will lead to a loss of 90% of the parkland there, and there's only going to be 0 0.6 hectare of parkland remaining, and there's going to be a deficit of at least three, if not five hectares, to the local area of open space. The council's changed its mind on the provision of open space and it may well change its mind again and that's why we don't believe there'll ever be a new park in park compensation for the loss of Portobello Park. We're not reassured about the protection of the golf course and the new park, the new park by Fields in Trust, as Fields in Trust by its own admission will not oppose a development if the council can make out a good enough case for it. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. We now move to category two. As I said, I will be closing the meeting at ten past ten. Um, I invite a spokesperson for Group One to speak on traffic and road safety issues. Okay. I think that, um, with your permission, I think that there isn't really time to go into in-depth questioning. So I'd like to read out um, just the closing remarks to stage two, uh, for category two, and maybe we'll do the same for three and four. Okay, but I have to offer the promoter. The opportunity. Well, I understand yes, that. Okay. And we would obviously have uh, time for a closing statement. This is why we're trying to manage the time correctly, madam. But if you're using your close if you lose your if you use your closing statement just I have to wait to closing statements. No. So I have to go to the promoter. It's a closing statement for each section. You know you, you do a yes, summary. I understand. Yes, I understand. Yeah, okay. But but what I'm saying to you is mm. because of the format, I now have to open it to the promoter. Then I'll come back to you for a closing statement. No, so uh, yeah, confused you. We'll re yes. read, just read out again um, the closing statement for each section uh -huh. rather than do questions through it. But, and then, but the promoter will still have to go through. So if you want to use your closing statement as your opening statement, that, yes. that's the only way it's going to go. That's the only way it's going yeah. to work. Yeah. So, so okay. it's up to yourself when opening you want to read that statement. Opening statement for road safety. Okay. No. Okay. Local residents have raised many concerns with the promoter over the many years this project has been developed, and yet few mitigation proposals have been accepted. A special meeting was held four years ago where specific issues, especially safety issues, were raised and the promise was made that these would be looked at. However, there has been no acceptance of the local residents' concerns, relying on a modelling exercise, but no safety audit. The residents experienced the con traffic congestion and recognise the safety implications as they live with it on a daily basis. As has become the practice of the promoter, repeating a statement that everything meets safety requirements or providing misleading information is substituted for careful analysis of what actually takes place. It is repeated that a nursery on the same stretch of road is a hazard, whilst the school for 1,400 pupils is not. It is pre presented that Transport Scotland is happy with the proposal when in fact they were presented with an environmental analysis and expressed no opinion for or against the proposal as their nearest trunk road is 3.2 kilometres away. We are told that no greater number of children will cross Milton Road than do at present, but the promoter willfully ignores the dinner time exodus and those who will travel by bus from the west. When considering Bailfield, the promoter marked it down for proximity to the main road. 
despite the barrier of a quiet cul-de-sac, but the main A1 feeder route into and from the city is not a problem. There are drop-off points, crossing of bus lanes, an infamous 1.2 metre wide pavement at the top of Park Avenue, along with many other unaddressed concerns, but nothing is a problem for the promoter. Local residents are rightly concerned for the safety of those using the school and for the safety of their own families. The objections on road safety grounds remain. Thank you, Van. Thank you. Now turn to the promoter again. I would specify the time issue that, that we do have. So if you've got... I'll keep it very brief. If you, you can. Um, I don't believe Group 1 objectors have raised anything um, substantive that's not already been fully addressed. In previous written or evidence, uh, oral evidence to, this, to the committee, uh, I must speaking? stress, as I've, I've done McIntyre. before, um, that safety is of paramount importance. Um, the Council proposal has fully complied with all aspects of applicable legislation and planning requirements for road and transport and pedestrian safety. Um, this, uh, the proposals have been considered uh, by a range of people who have expertise in uh, traffic and transport matters, including ACOM, professional consultant appointed to the project, the Council's Transportation Department, the Development Management Subcommittee, which have now fully considered this proposal twice um, through the planning process. None of them have identified significant risks in relation to road traffic or road safety implications in the new school, and appropriate mitigation measures have been proposed and will be put in place um, for those risks that do exist. Um, the suggestion of misleading information um, I reject utterly. Um, the suggestion that we um, said that Transport Scotland supported these proposals, I reject utterly. Um, we did receive, convener, some additional information that had been presented from um, Group 2 uh, just early, um, I think, um, midday yesterday, but um, there was a significant level of um, uh, inaccuracy in what they've conveyed to you, so we provided with a written submission to you last night, which will hopefully be of assistance. Beyond that, in the interest of time, um, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I know what you said at the start, but do you have any questions? No. Do you want to have any questions? No. Any final comments you wish to make? Said it. OK. We move to Category 3 then, and invite the spokesperson of Group 1 to speak on issues related to the visual impact, including loss of views and the height of the building. Ms. Okay. Scott, uh, uh, we stand by the evidence that we sent in. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Mackey. Give me a second. I have to go to the okay. promoter first right. and I come back. Okay. Um, I, in the interest of time, convener, um, we've covered everything either in early written submissions and oral evidence, and this has been considered twice during the planning process, so nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kemp's questions. Okay. Um, You said at the meeting on 23 April at column 261 the protected views across the Park Arthur seat will remain unobstructed. How do you know that? Because we've modelled the building in three dimensions and we have made a CGI view, a computer generated image view of the, of the situation. Why hasn't that been shared with the public? I think it has been, yeah. It has no, it been. hasn't. And I've got a map here which I'll, I'll distribute that shows the viewpoints that were assessed. The protected view of Arthur's seat is this is from here. None of these assess that view. That view was not assessed. That's the view that, that, that we presented at the consultation. Which yes. is a view from the, the far end of the park looking towards in. Arthur's seat. That view, that view was not assessed. It quite clearly shows on the map that the, the view along Brand Drive, which is this one, and the view along Milton Road were assessed, but the actual protected view across to Arthur's seat from, from Hope Lane was not assessed. Good view, this has been covered through the planning process. Oh, this, this is misinformation because it's there, you don't know how it's going to look. That's the bottom line, apart from the fact it's going to have five metre high mesh fencing in the foreground. This view's not been assessed. It's commonplace to provide photo montages for the planning application, isn't it? 
uh, for, for, to show the effect of buildings? That is a photo montage. Yes. There's a photograph well, there as a three-dimensional model been produced, which has been located on the site, and then a view taken. Sorry. Okay. Uh, for clarity. Is, that, is that the photo there that you're referring to that was on the... I can't see. I'll have to, just, I'll have to put on my glasses. It's the yes. yeah. Potterville Park yes. private bill information leaflet. Okay, yes. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, that's not accurate, is it? I mean, the, the, is it not accurate, sorry? That representation there, in that the depth of field is distorted, it's longer, and also um, the width of the development is extended by about 10% in comparison to the height. So you, you're giving a kind of a, a long distance view. You're not actually representing how it will appear. I, I mean, I think when you make perspective views, foreground does come up. If, if you go to the National Gallery and look at paintings, foreground, you know, in terms of perspective and depth of field, can look like that. I think that's. I think that's perfectly. I mean, it's it's been size, it's been dimension. So, I mean, there's nothing else we can do about that apart from present what is technically what we're being told. Okay. I disagree. That is distorted by widening it, making it look further away, reducing the impact. Shall we move on? Yeah. I'd just like to say I think it's clear that the, the materials that have been provided in relation to views and and the the impact of the building in its surroundings have been sadly lacking if not misleading sorry. sorry can i just ask a question have the council done anything to assess the impact on people who enjoy the visual access from milton road at the moment, the visual access to the fourth, Firth of Fourth across the park. So if you're travelling along Milton Road on a bus or in a car and you can currently look at the views, has anything been done to assess the impact of that? Which is not a protected view. I didn't ask if it was a protected view. I just asked if anything had been done to assess it. It was a protected view in the park and garden strategy of um, 2010, I think it was, or a document that we, we looked at earlier. We, we presented various views of the park. We presented views from the, from the east and from the west. I think we were very interested in the views along Milton Road. So you didn't consider any north-south, well, north-to-south? As, north as to Mr McIntyre says, that was not a protected view, so we, we didn't produce an image of that the design direction. Of, the design of the school has been done to um, minimise its impact into the local surroundings and maximise those views that can be preserved. Um, and uh, Architecture Design Scotland have, um, when they considered this um, design in 2010, um, identified it as being a potentially exemplary design. Can I go back to the site visit, Mr McIntyre? When we were in the park in October with the committee members, we spoke, or you spoke, I didn't say anything, about the height of the school building, and you described it as coming up to the height of houses that were in our line of sight as we looked towards Park Avenue. In fact, and I think this has been put on record, but I just wanted to draw it to the attention of the committee, that was incorrect. And you were looking at houses on Park Avenue, whereas the, the building is as high as the houses on Milton Road, and there's a full story of a difference. So, in fact, the impression of the height of the school would be at least one story higher than the verbal information that was given to the committee. Uh, not, not one story higher, but this, this was clarified in information that we provided to the committee back in, I think, uh, November 2013. Well, I think it's, it's close enough to a story higher, but we can clarify that. We don't have time just now, but I'll yeah. put in a submission just... Do you uh, have a question? Clarifying. Oh, so my apologies, can be, my apologies can be... My apologies. Yeah. OK, I don't have a question because we don't have time. <laughs> I do have lots of questions, but unfortunately we don't have time. Um, okay, does anyone have questions on this? Well, I'd like to ask if, whether the protected view was pointed out to the the committee on the site visit last October. Right, OK, but it just hasn't been assessed, that's all. OK, so that's not a question, that's a statement. Does the promoter have any questions? OK, are there any final comments in Category 3? No, just said it's clear that there's been... Um, misinformation or a lack of information about the visual impact that the building will have on its surroundings and the, the landscape. And I think people will get a nasty shock if it's built. OK. We move to Category 4. I invite a spokesperson from Group 1 to speak on the issues covered in Category 4, environmental issues which include light pollution, noise pollution, operational disturbances, loss of wildlife and biodiversity. I think, again, um, simply read out the 
opening closing statement when I find it. Right. Conflicting information has been given with reference to optimum lighting levels. For example, the EIA states that it should be as low as possible not to deter bats, and the SBD, Secure by Design, report says they should be as high as possible for security. We've heard what the lighting levels are going to be like, so it will conflict with the um, environmental impact assessment. High levels of spoke pitch flood lighting, um, 16,000 watt 10 metre high lighting poles will cause light spillage into people's homes and could lead to sleep disruption of children and elderly people. There will be general light pollution associated with the site and this will be up to 10 o'clock where other areas of cities control till 9. Uh, 13 and a half metre high lighting columns, luminaire lighting. There will be significant loss of immunity to local residents in terms of noise pollution from additional traffic, the sports pictures and plant. The introduction of a large number of people and vehicles circulating every day in the area and the introduction of HGVs to Park Avenue will have a significant impact on residential amenity. An unknown number of mature trees will be lost, as will around 50% of the millennium planting. And this reduction of habitat will lead to a loss of life, wildlife and biodiversity and increased disturbance to neighbours. Thank you. Uh, does the promoter have any brief comments? In the Given interest the of time, convener, nothing new has been raised here. We've previously covered this in previous written and oral evidence, so um, okay. no further statement to me. Do you have any questions for the promoter? No, do you have any questions? No. Nope. Subjectors? Any final comments other than, obviously, the final comments you just gave? No. Okay. That concludes the detailed evidence from the objectors and promoters in the five categories of objection. I may move on to questioning by committee mem members. Do members? <laughs> Alison, do you have... Yes, yes. Um, on loss of amenity and open space, I have a question for um, the promoters. Obviously, um, the replacement open space is, is very significant, and you've tried to um, protect that by fields and trust in relation to the new um, replacement space. In terms of the commitment to free access to the, the, the existing, no, sorry, the new football pitches. Um, what kind of guarantee can you give in perpetuity? You know, what can you do to, to reassure uh, the objectors on, on free access to local residents in perpetuity? The council has already taken the decision to, um, to provide that free access in perpetuity. What I would need to um, consider if there's anything else that we could yeah. ask the council to do um, to further reinforce um, the decision that's already taken. So it's certainly something that we'll, we'll take away. I, I, I'm not sure whether there is anything that we mm -hmm. could do, because Council has already taken a very clear decision in this matter, but I will take that away and see if there's anything that we could uh, further do um, to, uh, to provide that assurance. But it, um, it forms part of the, obviously, the very public um, discussions that we've had and debate around this bill. It um, also forms part of the compensatory measures that were associated with the planning consent for the new school. Um, so, uh, frankly, it would be um, ludicrous for the council to renege on those very strong commitments that have already been provided. And it's certainly not, from a children and families perspective, anything that we would countenance or propose. And ordinarily, recommendations to council come from officers. I, I do understand that, convener, but you, you've taken that extra step in relation to the replacement open space by putting in place fields and trust or yep. proposing to put in place fields and trust. So it would be useful if you were able to consider We'll that. certainly look at that and see if there's anything further we could do. Questions? No. Mr Hawkins, as lead objector to Group 1, do you have any final comments to make? Thank you. We have cooperated as far as possible in trying to meet the timetable set for the hearing of objections, at which we thought detailed examination would take place as to why the Council has arrived at this position. We are disappointed in the ruling to curtail our evidence, and after more than 10 years of the Council failing to provide a new school, it seems unnecessary for this democratic process to be cut short for the sake of an hour or two. We are unclear how you can move on to the next stage without having heard all the objections from all of the group's objectors. There have been difficulties of trust and clarity in dealing with the Council. Even now, it is withholding information from us that is evidence for this consideration stage. Over the years, it has said one thing, then done another. It says if the park is common good, it won't be built on, then proposes to do so. It says a new golf course is purchased, but it isn't. 
replacement open space is promised, and then this mitigation of the loss of parkland is removed, as it is in the wrong place. Then the same site is promised again, but inexplicably is now in the right place. The Council says access will be freely granted to the artificial pitches. I don't believe it, as this contradicts the current and future policy on community access to schools. They say access will be in perpetuity, as an inducement to support this bill, but it forms no part of it. Problem of trust. Well, the Council had said that Portobello Park was to be recreational parkland in perpetuity. The Council's definition of perpetuity and parkland is a period of time until they want to build on it. We have not heard a clear reason from the Council as to why, in 2008, they decided to follow a course of action that its own legal opinion unequivocally stated has, was extremely risky and eventually proved to be totally flawed. Maybe the term extremely risky is not the correct phrase. Perhaps willfully negligent is more apt. Officers within the Council knew that there was no power to build on the park, this was not made public knowledge, not even to councillors when they followed the recommendations put to them. It is a pity for everyone in Portobello that the pressure from some for Portobello High School to be prioritised first above the other Wave 3 schools resulted in the burying of the, of the initial advice. A different question being asked and a different opinion being given. The first legal opinion obtained by the council in August 2008 was not superseded. It exists and it is valid. It's not been withdrawn. But it was hidden from councillors and the general public alike, including both supporters and objectors to the plan to develop the park. You're aware that the council was found to have no powers to take the park for development and that its decision of 26th of April 2012 was ruled ultra vires and that was considered by three senior judges. A decision that should not have been a surprise to the Council, as we now know they had a clear legal opinion telling them this as long ago as 2008. For this unusual bill, you cannot disentangle the past from the present. We know this is contrary to the statement that what happened before 2012 has no bearing on this matter, but we can find no reference or guidance issued which precludes consideration of the historical context of the bill. And we maintain that what happened in the time before the court judgment is totally germane to this process. The council had the opportunity to do something different in 2008, but chose to gamble on a risky course of action and to the loss of all in Portobello. The City of Edinburgh Council is now looking to Parliament to get it out of this disastrous mess it has created for itself by not listening, and they're not listening still. You have heard evidence that whilst a particular private bill will confer no powers on others for any act, by passing this bill, a behavioural precedent will be set which highlights a route others will follow. And how can you pass a bill for one body and not another? You have evidence that the private bill process should not be followed as the legal constraints should be addressed through public legislation. You have heard that the Council has deliberately run down Portobello Park over many years in order to say it is unused. There is ample evidence that some schools in Edinburgh are being provided without, being, without taking adjacent urban parkland. Importantly for this process, you have heard many concerns about how the consultation for this bill targeted to the school community was manipulated by the council as the developer to get the result it wanted. You have criticised the consultation. At this point it is unclear how the committee will assess the evidence, how it will be validated and checked for accuracy. The amendment clause about the future legal status of Portobello Park presented by the promoter is not understood and could not be easily explained by the promoter when clarification was sought. You have actually clarified some of these uh, points for going forward. We, the objectors to the private bill, support a new Portobello High School, but we can have a new school and retain Portobello Park. The Council has failed from the start to manage the risk of this project. It has hidden legal opinions 
and then publicly feigned surprise at losing the appeal that rendered its decision ultra vires. It has threatened to sue us and it has blamed us for the delay in providing a new school when all the delay has been of its own making. There are still too many uncertainties as to whether all of the objections have been addressed and what ramifications may come from the passing of this bill. We and other objectors have provided ample evidence to you about the failure of the promoter to manage the process to provide legal clarity and we have raised many doubts about the trust that can be placed on any promise, that's any promise, by the City of Edinburgh Council. On the objections presented, both oral and written, there is sufficient evidence to recommend that this bill should not be passed. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Does the have any brief final comment? I had some closing remarks, Convener, but um, very I, brief. I, will, I will make them very brief. Um, uh, thank you again for uh, the opportunity to, to address you. Um, I have emphasised this point in previous sessions, but it's, it's so important that um, I hope the committee will forgive me for reiterating it one more time. Um, the council, and I believe nobody would be um, a, a, in denial of this, that um, Portobello High School needs to be replaced as soon as possible. And we are firmly of the view that Portobello Park is by far the most cost-effective, the quickest um, and best location on which we could uh, build the new school. The only feasible option of a phased rebuild on the combined site of Portobello High School and St John's RC Primary School would be far more expensive, take far longer to deliver, and would have to significantly compromise on the educational facilities that could be made available in comparison to what can be delivered by citing the new school in the park. It would also require St John's um, RC Primary School uh, to be uh, relocated. The decision to, um, to locate the school in Portobello Park is not one that has been taken lightly. It's been reached after careful consideration and assessment on several occasions of all of the possible alternative options, as well as extensive public consultation. And the Council is pleased that a significant majority of people in the local community agree that the park offers the best location for the new school. Uh, we do appreciate the proposal has generated um, some opposition. Um, the objectors today and at the other sessions have expressed their views um, very strongly on what they regard as downsides. Whilst we respect the views of individual objectors, uh, we cannot simply accept the validity of many of the claims made about the negative consequences that would result from either the passage of the bill or from building the new school. Uh, I would also um, uh, abs make it absolutely clear again that the Council categorically refutes any suggestions of impropriety on its part at any stage of the project and any suggestions of withholding information which are completely untrue. We cannot and do not claim that we have a perfect um, solution to the problem we are faced with. However, a perfect solution does not exist. Um, we do believe that the benefits of building a new school in the, on the park, including the improvements made, the remaining open space on the site and other spaces in the area, and the other compensatory and mitigation measures that will accompany the project, including the creation of a significant area, entirely new area of open space, would result in a net gain for the local community. Where legitimate concerns have been raised about the Council's proposals, we have taken steps to address and alleviate those as far as possible. Um, and we have said repeatedly we were open to suggestions from objectors as to how we might improve our proposals and further alleviate their concerns. However, um, they persist in saying that um, the only solution is that the school should be built elsewhere. Um, that's not something that we can accept or are prepared to do. We remain firmly of the view that none of the issues raised by the objectors, um, either today or in earlier sessions, constitute a valid reason um, uh, to abandon our proposals. That would require the Council to pursue the far more expensive, far more time-consuming a far more disruptive alternative option of a phased rebuild in the existing site, involving all of the compromises that, that, that would result. <coughs> we do hope our, the committee shares our view that none of the issues in, of detail discussed today or in earlier sessions um, constitute reasons for recommending the bill should not proceed, and that any disadvantages in the proposals would be adequately addressed um, through the compensatory and mitigation measures that we have proposed. Of course, however, we would be welcome um, to any suggestions from committee. If there are further steps that, that you believe we could take um, to allay any further concerns that members might have, including proposing or discussing any further amendments to the bill um, that you might consider to be appropriate. Likewise, if we can assist the committee further by providing any additional information to assist you in considering the issues raised, we would obviously be more than happy to do so. I just close by thanking you again for the opportunity to address you today and in the previous sessions at both the preliminary and consideration stage.
Thank you. Thank you. And I thank all participants for their attendance this morning. That concludes the public part of the meeting and we now move into private.